It's time now for our politics panel with Susan Page, Washington Bureau Chief of USA Today, Ed O'Keefe, who covers politics for the Washington Post. We also welcome back Washington Times columnist and Fox News contributor Tammy Bruce and Ezra Klein, who is the founder and editor-in-chief of Vox.com. Tammy, I want to start with you on this question of Russia. Donald Trump, according to what Mr. Priebus uh, said today, seems to have had a bit of an evolution from his previous skepticism. Priebus now says he believes what everybody else does. The Russians hacked into this election. What do you make of that? Well, I think they hacked into um, the DNC. Mm -hmm. They didn't hack into the election. And I think that what we also know, of course, is that, and this is what's interesting, is that you've got uh, James Clapper, who was advising, of course, Donald Trump, who just in 2013, when we talk about how seriously we can take this and why the American people want to know more about what happened and why President-elect wants to know more, James Clapper lied about the uh, spying on every single American to Congress, Del was asked specifically about whether or not there was a program uh, where Americans were being spied on. He said no. Still, years later, they're saying, well, he said it was the least untruthful thing he could tell Congress. So the American people for the last several years have looked at a system that hasn't taken them seriously and has lied to them. Uh, of course, coupled with, of course, the Iraq situation. But ultimately, right now, I think that the American people want America to be first. Of course, uh, we want a, a cabinet that's going to take Russia seriously. He's put together one that, that will. Uh, and also, it seems like there's an interest in either having a new Cold War or that there's an effort to uh, gin up the problems, when in fact, even Hillary Clinton, one of the first things Hillary and Obama did was embrace the Russians, wanted a reset. Mm -hmm. So this is not unusual. But I think there's a difference between the, the narrative that the election was hacked versus, and I'll remind you, the first thing that was released when the Podesta emails were hacked was an oppo dump on Trump. It was the Democrats... Uh, opposition research on Donald Trump. So the entire notion that this was about to help Donald Trump, I think, is belied by that, especially. I think, <clears throat> Susan, there are two things. There's, there's the question of the Russians in the election, but then there's been Donald Trump's reaction to this, which has now changed. It's, it appears, although we're still, that's still evolving. What do you make of that? Is this an effort to get this behind them? Is it, um, what's your take? Well, I think Ryan Tepibus has and Donald Trump have pretty grudgingly gotten to the point where all the intelligence agencies, Republicans in Congress and Democrats are, which is that Russia made this unprecedented attempt to affect our election. This report that came out this week, the unclassified report, is incredible and extraordinary and deserves to be read. But this doesn't settle it because the issue now is what do you do about it? And you know that people like Senator McCain and maybe even Senator McConnell want there to be repercussions for Russia for this action against the, an American democracy. And the question is what will happen? What will the Trump administration be willing to do? What steps will it be willing to take to punish Russia for what it did? And Ed, the uh, president-elect tweeted that uh, why not be friends with Russia? So it doesn't look like there's a, a uh, while there's an acknowledgement that they hacked, there doesn't seem to be uh, the kind of language we're hearing, as Susan said, from the majority leader who strongly condemned it and John McCain and so Yeah, he, he's going to have himself a, a pretty interesting time with his Republican colleagues on Capitol Hill who clearly want to keep this going. There's going to be another hearing on Tuesday that looks into Russia, into cybersecurity and other things, and the, and the issue isn't going away. Uh, but I thought it was it was important, as you pointed out, that President Obama came into office and said, I want to talk to the Pakistanis and talk to the Iranians and talk to the Cubans, and those things were done. Uh, look, if there's a way to, to find a way to work with Putin, great, uh, but certainly Republicans up on Capitol Hill are going to continue to express a lot of concern. Although, Ezra, the, the majority leader said, well, he's going to be disabused of any warm feelings he may have about working with Russians this that, time around. That was fascinating, that it his was. position on this was that what's going to happen is Donald Trump is simply confused about Russia coming in. I, I do want to note something that's interesting. Ryan's previous came on and he said, what happened here, the real story is how easy it was to hack the Democratic National Committee. There's actually something to that, by the way. But currently, the, the judgment of the intelligence agencies is both the Republican National Committee and the DNC were hacked. Russia kept the data from the RNC and released the data from the DNC. And it's worth noting that that means there is a lot of information sitting there in Russian servers. And putting aside the question of the election for a second, we do have to think as a country in a world where cyber war and cyber espionage are going to become much more common, how we are going to manage these kinds of things going forward, particularly given that from what we know, Russia is probably sitting on a storehouse of other embarrassing information that could be used for other purposes. If I could just add something that was happening simultaneously is this. 
In 2015, we spent over 350,000 taxpayer dollars funding an organization in Israel called One Voice, which we learned once we gave them those grants, they immediately began to build up an infrastructure to oppose Netanyahu in Israel. This is not unknown. It was widely reported in the summer of last year that it was an Obama-aligned group of people that worked with his campaign that were the consultants to that effort to dislodge Netanyahu, an active campaign in Israel. This was happening in 15, reported in the summer of 16. So it involved the same things we're accusing the Russians of, trolling on the internet, but on the ground boots, developing a database, actively working against Netanyahu. This government, the Washington Post noted that this was gross interference with the only democracy in the Middle East. I would assert that Obama was limited in what he could say about Russia because he was doing exactly the same thing to Israel. And also when it comes to the issue about not wanting to touch the Russians, we were in the middle of the Syrian negotiations while this was occurring as well, and the desire to not interrupt that. Just like he, his red line disappeared for Syria because he didn't want to upset the nuke deal in Iran. But for an incoming president, now Barack Obama's in the rearview mirror, we've got an incoming president now. Let's hope Barack Obama's in the rearview mirror. The, uh, I, I think, that unless, <laughs> unless you got some information, you know I don't, in we two don't? weeks we're gonna have a, a, a new president. Um, but uh, you, Donald Trump does seem to have uh, a much more, co you know, um, open relationship and thinking about Russia than, than than we've seen before, and certainly than his Republican. Well, colleagues. I don't think so. He hasn't sat down with Medvedev and, and said, you know, I'm going to be more flexible when I get in, and nothing's been transmitted As to Obama Vladimir. Was to have so. Said. Uh, I'm sorry. As Obama was overheard As, to have said exactly. before Exactly. So forgive me. Yeah. I mean, there have been clearly it's a, there's an interest in having a relationship. Um, as that is noted, with a variety of, of nations, thinking that it'll be beneficial. And Russia, of course, they have certainly have taken over the Middle East at this point. We've got an interest in dealing with them in that regard, at least getting our interest back in that region. Let's switch to Obamacare. Ed, where do things stand right now, as you see it, in terms of the repeal? Uh, the process begins Wednesday. Mark your calendars. There's going to be uh, votes all day long on the Senate floor on a piece of legislation that essentially gives instructions to get the ball rolling. Uh, and you're going to see up or down votes on a host of, of uh, what we call poison pill amendments, basically won't, won't pass but allow either party to say things about each other. Uh, look, repeal is underway. The replace remains to be seen. There is no concrete plan, no one plan from the Republican Party yet to do something. Uh, there have been plans uh, that have been constructed in the bowels of the Rayburn building or over in the Dirksen building, but they have not seen the light of day, and they certainly won't find unanimous agreement among Republicans about how exactly this should be tackled. It's going to be uh, an incredible lift for the Republican Party alone to figure this out, let alone to get any Democrats to go along with them. And I think you're going to start to see Democrats do a far better job of defending this law now that it might be taken away. Defending it when their guy is in office and when they put it in place is one thing. But when a government starts to try to take something away from people, it's much easier to sell. You've seen Democrats do it when it comes to Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. They'll add Obamacare to the list going into the midterms next year. All right, we've set the table there. We'll come back and talk about Obamacare in a moment, but we've got to take a little short break. So stick with us, and we'll be back with more from our panel. And we're back now with our panel. Ezra, Ed mentioned the Democrats are going to be robust and they're pushing back against this Republican effort. What's their line of argument? So I interviewed President Obama about this this week, actually. We had a long discussion about Obamacare. And his challenge to the Republicans is simply, show me the plan that gets more people covered at a lower cost than mine. And, and I was thinking about that when I listened to Senator McConnell on the show this morning. The thing Republicans are about to run into is what they dislike about Obamacare and what is unpopular about Obamacare are different. So Senator McConnell came out and he said, look, Obamacare does not actually cover everyone, which is true. He said the deductibles in Obamacare are very high, which is also true. Now, I've actually read the Republican replacement plans floating around. Every single one of them, to my knowledge, has lower levels of coverage than Obamacare currently does and significantly higher deductibles. So the thing that McConnell and others are going to run into and the thing that Democrats are going to be making their central line of attack is yes, everybody would love to see Obamacare replaced with something even more terrific. But if your replacement actually leads to 5 million or 7 million or 12 million people losing insurance and deductibles at the $9,000, $10,000 range, are people actually going to like that better? I think not. Susan, I was also interested that the majority leader said there will be a gap between repeal and replace. There seems to be uh, some of his Republican, uh, I mean, obviously Senator Paul has said they got to happen on the same day. What do you, how does that gap get managed? 
Yeah, they're gonna, there's going to be a gap, right? Because they've, they've been repealing it more than, they've tried to repeal it more than 60 times, and now finally it's going to go through. That's going to happen. But they don't have a consensus on a replacement. And, and in fact, I think the Trump team has set up a very difficult situation for themselves, which is to say they don't think anybody who has insurance now should lose it. Uh, they said that they want to keep the, the pre-existing conditions provisions, which is a very difficult thing to, to guarantee. We hear Republicans talking not about universal coverage, which is what Obamacare talked about. They talk about universal access, which is something different and presents a whole new set of challenges when it comes to health care policy. So there's going to be a gap. How long? Rapidly? Very quickly? We don't really know how long that uh, that gap is going to be, but I would, don't, don't you think it's going to be years before they have I a I don't think they know if they can ever get a replacement through. I mean, the, the hard part is not coming up with a plan. I mean, the hard part is actually getting the House and the Senate to agree on a plan. It's getting into legislative language. It can mm -hmm. actually work. This is very difficult stuff. And I just want to say on repeal and delay, if there is that gap, the Obamacare marketplaces will collapse in the interim. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just hold steady. The insurers will leave because mm -hmm. they don't know what will happen next. So the Republicans will be not just managing the status quo, but managing a collapsing status quo. Tammy, what, why, is, why, why not have a little bit of a delay, get ducks in a row and all of that? Yeah, look, I don't, it's already collapsing. We're no, speaking, it really isn't, We're actually. speaking, we've got, when it comes to the exchanges, but, be, but beyond that, um, you've got, you don't need to have a delay at all. And we're, we're looking at this. This is the other problem is when government is involved. Suddenly, suddenly, this is only a conversation about the government replacing its own government plan, as opposed to maybe like, as I'm seeing some people are suggesting, an Uber-type model, putting the marketplace back in charge. But ultimately, there's a lot of things, and they've discussed uh, uh, executive orders. There's things you can do to make a, a difference here, and that includes, and from USA Today, Heather Higgins' uh, op-ed, discussing having Congress have skin in the game, removing their waiver, but more importantly, making it possible through a, one line of, 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 of language in, in the bill that allows insurance companies to provide um, policies that don't adhere to the Obamacare standards so you can get a, a catastrophic policy and also tort reform. But I mean, you've got to have a dynamic where the insurance companies can once again go about their business without being constrained by the ridiculousness of having men pay for birth control that they, that they don't want. And as a result, also uh, risk pools in the states. Grant block funds to states for risk pools for people who have pre-existing conditions. But that all takes time to manage. Well, but but at the same time, these were not complaints with Obama. You can do these in se sections that happen very quickly mm -hmm. at the time. But just when it comes to not just legislation, but also executive orders that, that Trump can do within a week. What do you think, Susan, switching to the confirmation question, will happen? I mean, you Democrats want to delay them. Yeah. It doesn't look like the majority leader is going to delay them. You know, he, he's not going to delay the hearings to wait for the, the financial paperwork to be done. But I thought he made some news in your interview when he said that the Senate will not vote on, on confirming nominees uh, on the floor unless, they're, unless and until their, their uh, Office of the Government Ethics paperwork is completed. That has been the practice in the past. Ed and I were talking about this yeah. in the green room. But it's not part of the law. There's nothing that requires them. This was something I think they, have not com they had not committed to previously. So that means that... Now, it's, this is still not a good deal, Democrats say, because it means that when they're having those confirmation hearings, they may not know everything that they would want to ask a, a nominee about if they don't have all the paperwork done. But it does mean that at least they won't be confirmed for their, for their cabinet office until that work is done. 15 seconds, Ed. What are the, who are the... Uh, well, apparently I'm being told Rex we don't Tillerson. have time. Rex we'll Tillerson. have to <laughs> tune in next week for that question. Thanks to all of you. And we'll be back in a moment.